I don't know if I've shared this before, but I've been thinking about it a lot. And it's with the term scholar. When I hear educators refer to their students as scholars, I understand the intention that we're trying to really lift up our, our, our students when we do this. My struggle is the term scholar really connects with academics specifically and with school. And does it send a message to our students that if you don't continue in school, if you're not necessarily good at school, then maybe you struggle. And it's kind of, that's where I struggle with this because I understand the term scholar when it said it's to elevate our students, but not all kids want to go to school and not all kids want to go to college. And I think a lot about my education and when I went to school as a kid, it was kind of this perception that if you don't go to college, somehow your life is less. And the thing that is really important to me is not that all of our kids graduate and are actually walk out and have the same mentality and the same experience is that every single kid walks out and knows what their gifts are and how they can contribute that to their world, to our world and how we utilize those things. And this is why I really loved having this conversation with Dr. Tom Tui today because his work in inclusion is really powerful in a school district. I had a wonderful opportunity to connect with all of them. And one of the things I always say is how do we help students find their a, a pathway to success that is meaningful to them? And a lot of times when we talk about success, it's the expectations the adults have of what the kids do, not necessarily getting the kids to define that for themselves. And to, to really do that, we have to kind of help these kids figure out who they are, what their gifts are, what they bring to the table. I think Dr. Tom does a really great job kind of expressing some of the ways they do this in their district and how we can help our students. We talked about this and a lot of other things in this conversation. Uh, it was really wonderful to ca catch up. As I said, I, I, I keynoted their district um, at the beginning of this school year and they have a blank slate. They have a new superintendent and there's just a great energy and you can feel it, um, the excitement in, in Tom in, in the way we talk today. So I know you're going to love this podcast. I had a great time talking with him. Uh, thank you for being here. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm blessed to have uh, Associate Superintendent, is Associate or Assistant? Assistant, assistant superintendent. Can you just change it? Like, does it matter? Like, what, what's the difference between associate and assistant? That's like, I think that's a, you I know you're not assistant too. You're assistant, right? Uh, it's not like an office situation. I don't know if, the, if in practice it would make much of a difference. Either way, I'm, I'm just, I'm supporting the district and, and the superintendent now. So, yeah. So, Tom is actually uh, from Edison Township School District. And I, and I did in the last podcast, but they're just awesome. I'm going to give them a little <laughs> shout out. Wonderful, wonderful group of people. Um, so I, I got to meet Tom this summer. I know we've connected. Where did we connect prior to? Because I know we talked that we had met somewhere before. So I was previously a principal in Lawrence Township. And uh, I know you had spoken there way back. Um, I wasn't involved with it, but we ended up connecting on, on Twitter a couple of different times. Right, but, you said about me tweeting your blog. Yeah, yeah. You retweeted me. It was great. It was during the pandemic. And I think I said something about this guy keeping me afloat right now because, you know, it's a tough time for everybody. Right. Uh, but I know that I know that some of my former colleagues in Lawrence had had connected with you previously. So it was great to to meet you in person for the first time at our convocation. You did yeah, a great it was, job. It was me, me and you just hung out there while you know everything was going on. So it was uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And so I know it's kind of cool because you you do have a new superintendent. Not like I should say you have a new person who's in the role of superintendent, who is acting superintendent, who is in a different role. And one of the things I said that day, and I think it's I just want everyone to think about is it's beautiful when you have a new superintendent because everyone's got a blank slate, right? Yep. Everyone starts with a blank slate and what you do with it really matters. So Tom, uh, if you can just kind of start off, tell us who you are, what you do today, how you got there. It's a great place to start. Sure. So uh, Tom Tui, I'm the assistant superintendent for pupil special services. We have some designations in our district in terms of what our, super, our assistant superintendents are responsible for. So I oversee our special education department, uh, special teachers, child study, um, guidance, and it's kind of a continuation of my role in education. So I was a I was a <laughs> I was a classified student um, and special education student. Then I became a special education teacher, and then I became a special ed administrator. Hmm. Took a quick pit stop as a principal in Lawrence Township, which was an awesome experience. Then I got back into special ed. 
So uh, that's where I am now, essentially just kind of planning programmatically for the the needs of our most exceptional students. And it, yeah. it's really rewarding work. Um, it, it's, it's cool. I, I stepped away from it for a few years and realized that, you know, they're outside of developing a skill set associated with this role. Like right. I just missed, I, I missed the conversations that I had to get, have with families and being able to, when I was leaving as a director, before I get, became a principal, um, some uh, the superintendent had said like, Hey, I forget exactly how the conversation went, but I, I remember saying something along the lines of like, you know, I, I don't trust anybody like to say it, but like anybody else to advocate for the needs of these kids in this role, because it's such a sensitive population, such a sensitive right. community. So um, I didn't really have that opportunity as much as a principal. And uh, when this came around, I was like, let me jump at it. So that's awesome. Well, you know, so one of the nicest things I've ever heard about uh, innovators mindset and is someone said to me, the, the thinking that we have in the area of special education and inclusion through the innovators mindset, you kind of brought it mainstream that this is kind of the thinking that should be done with every student in our classrooms. Cause to be honest with you, all of our students have gifts, you know, they mm -hmm. all have things and how do you bring that out? So how do you actually see, you know, your role and what you do now basically affecting everybody. Cause I don't think it's just limited to specific students. Um, cause all of our students have needs, all of our students have gifts. So how do you, you know, kind of bridge that, you know, some of the work that you're doing to influence everybody in your school district. Sure. So, and I don't want to step too far into the, into the curriculum side. Right? right. But one of the things that I feel like we do really well in special education is I, I, it's like you hear it so often, but it really is that informed decision making, right? We have students that go through a battery of psychoeducational evaluations. And then from there, as teachers, we figure out what the best course is for them and it, it, as child study. So our, our special education students, an IEP that identify very clearly what the goals are as aligned to the curriculum, that's something that we can mirror and model on the gen ed side of the ball. In, in a former district, we would put together um, similar plans. We called them ISIPs, Individual Student Improvement Plan, for gen ed kids that weren't classified, um, using the data that was available to us. Now, it's not going to be like a, a woodcock or a whisk or something like that, but sure, we had, we had functional academic data and we had evaluation data to make decisions on, on which standards we really need to hit for these students who weren't yet classified. Mm -hmm. So like changing that mindset, I mean, I've honestly seen it kind of, when you reference the innovator's mindset, I, I read it as a special ed guy. I was like, wow, there's a lot of things that we're doing in gen ed classrooms that we should be doing with special ed kids. But, um, you know, there's a lot we can also learn from the special ed side of the ball. So just making really good decisions about how we're instructing kids based on where their strengths and or deficits are. Um, so how do you, how do you like, and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of paperwork stuff that you probably got to do in their role. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. And not, not me personally, right. Our child study team. Um, I have my own paperwork, but, but right. yes. Yeah. There's so a lot. How do, how, like, and I think that like how, how much of it is that like a frustrating part of the job or you see as necessary part of the job? Because I think a lot of times, um, when, when I, and I talked about the idea of learner driven evidence informed practice, you know, data informed evidence informed, very similar in the mentality. Cause the, 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 I'm glad you didn't say data driven. And I think I talked about it that day. I hate that term. Cause it's like, you're not driven by data. You're driven by kids. Right. But being informed by data, by evidence is really, really important. How much of that is like, like really kind of just understanding the kids actually doesn't happen in the paperwork. Cause I think sometimes we do all of this stuff, write all of this stuff, but sometimes it's just a conversation that it's really hard to, it's really hard to document, but tells us a lot about the kids. Like, how do you kind of balance that out? Because there is a frustration that a lot of teachers didn't get into the role to do tons of documentation, right? They, they, and so how do you kind of, how do you kind of dig into that? Cause I, I know that's a frustration a lot of people have. Sure. So I, I can kind of answer from two ways. I know as a, um, as a teacher, uh, looking over my IEPs every year and understanding the modifications and the goal could be goals could be overwhelming. Yeah. Um, so just in terms of, in terms of students being successful, like I, I had so many kids in class that their, their IEP wasn't obviously wasn't reflective of who right. they are as a person. And we, we talked before about a teacher that influenced me. And, and one of the things that I would try to do is 
really develop that connection, understand that school may not be for, for this kid long term. So what is right? Um, big part of what we do with secondary students as a secondary teacher is develop transition plans to talk about how we get a student from point A to point B um, after high school. And that's really where I would focus my, you know, uh, focus my attention is how, how are we going to move this child towards their goals? Now you have to, you have to um, focus on the goals that are laid out in the IEP that are curricular. I mean, you can get into, I don't, Dis, I don't disparage parents for uh, for exercising their due process rights in very many ways. It's it's why we have the special education programs we do now. But if you don't follow the IEP, you, you get into that situation. As an administrator, though, when you talk about data informed, a lot of times for us, it's 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 leverage. Like we have um, we have a disproportionality um, issue in Edison, and I don't want to get too into the weeds, but it has a lot to do with how the number is calculated. But one thing that you can't argue with is that our students are not, our, our classified students don't demonstrate the same level of pr proficiency in reading. Okay, that's clear. Right. So what, what can we do about that? And when I start to advocate for programs or certifications or, or moving our staff towards, in this case, the kind of the gold standard being like Orton certification for our, all our special ed staff, well, that's costly. Um, but it, it's really clear in what's coming out of, of these assessments. So there's there's kind of two ways to look at it, right? As a teacher, yeah, there's stuff you have to get through, but at the center of that is a human being. For me, it is a secondary teacher, right. the focus what's this child's long-term goal? And then as an administrator, it's it's really more about, okay, what can we do from a more global programmatic perspective to actually use those data and and do something positive for the overall student body of kids? Yeah. And there's something, there's something you said there that kind of sparked a thought that I've been having lately. And I, this is going to maybe, you know, get me in trouble saying this. I really struggle. I, I, it, there, it just irks me. I shouldn't say I hate it, but sometimes I would say that uh, is when I hear uh, teachers referring to kids as scholars, right? Okay. And the yeah. reason I struggle with that is because scholars is a very academic term. It's about academics. It's about going to college. Like it just feels that way. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, there's a little bit of a, a context that basically if, if school is not for you, somehow you're a failure. That's what yeah. I struggle with. Right. In the sense that, do we are we trying to get every kid to be the same kid by the time they leave school? Or are we trying to ensure that every kid knows what their strengths are, what their gifts are, what they're really good at, and that it leads to different things? And I think that to me, like it kind of that was something that kind of stuck out to me. What you said about that is that you know maybe school is not for some for some kids. And I'm not talking, I'm not talking specifically in the inclusion area or the special education area. I'm talking about any kid in any program, but it's like somehow if you don't, if you're not a school kid, if you're not a scholar, somehow mm -hmm. you're a failure. And that mm -hmm. I really struggle with is that it's, it's like, you're, you're saying like, Hey, our kids have different gifts, but you all got to kind of be academic and everything's about academics. And I, I, I make a distinction between, I say sometimes there's a, there's a huge difference between the idea of our smartest kids and our top academic students, so, because some of our, smartest kids are terrible academically and, but they have gifts that we're not appreciating because they don't fit into the, the little bubbles that we have in school that we say are important. So how, how do you kind of, you know, fit that too? Cause I think that, you know, you probably get a challenge on that sometimes too, is that while well, all these kids should be, you know, focused on school and going to college and all this other stuff. Do you kind of see that as something you're dealing with? Uh, yeah, our, our, we have a very high performing, uh, academic community, but yeah. we, the, this one example jumps out in my mind and uh, a kid, not a kid guy's a full grown man. Now he's wildly successful. This kid, Brendan Hall, right. Yeah. What ended up happening with Brendan was I was, I wasn't even his teacher. Um, we shared some of the same interests. So I was asked to go to his IEP meetings with him in a lot of ways, just to kind of keep him from, from blowing his top. And as we got to know each other, we started to have those conversations about what do you want to do long-term Long story short, he ended up becoming an able-bodied seaman at the port. Now, could you imagine if I referred to my entire class as, okay, my able-bodied seaman, you know what I mean? Like right. that, who are you talking to? That's not me. Right. And that's, a, I think what a lot of kids go through when they're being, I guess, referred to as scholars in totality. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more that, listen, we have a lot of opportunity in this country. One, one avenue is the academic route. I mean, listen, college degrees pay dividends. They do. But that's some not. Of them, a, some of them do. 
Some of them. <laughs> Some of them do. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, that's not the only avenue for right. success for our students. And um, so I, I, I tend to agree with you. And I think right. you kind of paint into a box if you're referring your, to your entire class as scholars. Now, arguably, what are they doing right then and there? Yeah, they should be focusing on school. I get it. But that's not really what you're telling them as teachers. Like, this is what you are and, and will right. be moving. So, I mean, if you just take the inverse of it and start, start calling all of your all of your students, I, I don't know. Um, right. right. OK, my electricians like it's right, right. That's that's a, yeah. And I struggle with that. And when I say, you know, like I, when I say some of them do, I yeah. actually I'm referring to myself because I when I went to I felt that I had to go to college because if I didn't go to college, I would be a loser. Like mm -hmm. and it wasn't I got that from from school. I got that from conversations. I got that. And so what did I do? I go to college and basically just take whatever classes and just mm -hmm. like, I guess that's going to be my major. And then it took me, and I, I joke about it. It took me six years to get a four-year degree because I kind of just floated around, um, doing something. Cause I felt I had to do it because of somewhere. And so if I actually never transferred what I like, I would have never got any job. Um, if I would have got the degree that I first pursued the word, and I shouldn't say, I don't know if I pursued it, but it was like kind of mildly interested in. And mm -hmm. it's, it's because of that too. So there is, you know, there is a little bit of bias in me because I felt I was pressured into something because if, if I didn't do it, I wouldn't be worthy of anything because that was kind of the message that was sent. So, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate that distinction because like, I understand, I under, like, I don't hold a grudge against anyone who refers their kids as scholars, but I think mm -hmm. that lang some of that language, you got to kind of just pull back and say like, what are we actually saying to our kids is that there's only an academic route that matters. Right. Cause like, if you're a, you know, if I'm a, if all I care about is basketball and you call me a scholar, I'm like, why are you calling me a scholar? Right. Like, that's that's not my interest and it's not that you know there, there's different things in, in in what you're doing so that 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 actually I, I appreciate that so now you have a you have a new superintendent i had i was lucky to have ed on the the podcast as well what what opportunities do you see kind of have and i'm not saying i don't know anything about your former leadership to be honest with you mm -hmm. um but what opportunities do you see in just maybe not only just for you, but for your entire district, when you have that blank slate, when you just have like a, a fresh start, uh, something that you're maybe looking to, to do in Edison, you know, in this upcoming year. Sure. So one of the things that I've noticed just generally to your point, right, whenever there's a change in leadership, it, it always is an opportunity in this case, specifically though, it's a really interesting one because Dr. A and I, we, we never worked together in the same district, but we, we had kind of a, similar parallel uh, career track to some extent. Um, you know, you have a you have a guy leading one of the you know largest districts in the state of New Jersey, essentially as a principal. Now, don't get me wrong. He's a systems thinker. He understands how this works, but he was a 14 year principal. He spent two years in HR. So all of a sudden you have a principal who was focused on the right things leading right. from a district perspective. I think you probably saw it our first day. Um, the culture in this district is, from my perspective, already starting to change. Um, people are being given the opportunity to take risks. And I'm talking all the way up here. There are some things I would love to talk about, but I haven't even talked about with my board yet. Um, because Ed was just like, go for it. You know what I mean? And, right. and maybe we fail, but if you think it's the right thing to do for kids, do it. Right. Um, you know, in the classroom, hearing that message uh, is is really powerful because I I can't again I don't want to speak to people that have led this district previously. The last guy was was great too, but before that, I think sometimes get people get into the role of superintendent and they they look at themselves more as managers than they do as educators anymore. Yeah. And and uh, and that's not the case with with Ed. Um, so it really is a fresh opportunity. It's a great place to, uh, to start doing some, some innovative stuff. He's asked the question, right? Like, okay, we're this big, large school district. What are we known for that's innovative? Right. Well, no, nothing as of right now. I mean, I could point to some stuff and make a case for it, but right. we really should be out in front sort of defining our message, the community uh, about the great things that we're doing and are going to do. Um, and just to kind of bring it full circle, like having that building level perspective to start is is kind of how you get there because you're more inclined to to take risks as a classroom teacher as a building principal than you are as a central office administrator when you're eating your your three hour lunches, you know. So, 
<laughs> Who would say you have three hour? No one would say that. No one would say you have three hour lunches, right? But Only it, a jerk would say that, probably. Hey, it is an awesome opportunity, though, and it's a it blank yeah. slate for everybody. Um, so yeah, it's good stuff. So you know, so I we were talking about this briefly. I had the opportunity to keynote your entire district, and I think it was like twenty five hundred people. It was like a massive you, and it's a. a from what I understood, if it wasn't the first time ever, it was the first time in a very long time you all came together because your district is so large. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you're talking about Ed, I was thinking about this. A lot of people or a lot of districts that I've worked with, they, they use the excuse of like, oh, we're so big, you know, like we can't do certain things because we're like a slow moving train. It takes forever to like change initiatives. And I actually do not get that feeling at all. There, and it is that the best large districts that I've ever worked with do everything to make it feel like a, like a small district. If that makes sense. Like, Hey, like, and, and part of it is getting to know people, you know, making it very personal, referring to certain people. Uh, one of the things I noticed about that day was all of the teachers that were honored. I think one of your teachers actually had been there for over 50 years and she was a Yeah. Right. And so that, that to me is when you, when you say people's names, when you know people and you go out of your, and you're never satisfied that, you know, enough people you go out to, can, can you, cause you're going to take forever to, to meet and, 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 and do names. Do you kind of feel that's one of the shifts that's happening is it's, you're taking a very large district and making it small in, in the sense of like, cause that, that, you know, when you're the more nimble you are, the more you can make those positive changes. It's, it's really interesting you say that because we had a, our chief academic officer just retire who'd been here forever. And one of the candidates asked like, hey, what stands out to you about Edison? And I'm not sure if it was like my turn to answer questions or not. But if you told me the scope of this place before I I, I took the position, I, I would have, you know, it still does sometimes seem overwhelming, but right. it starts to feel small really quick. And the fact that you answered that question, I think speaks more to... Um, more to Ed's leadership than anything right. else. Cause that's what he models for all of us. Right. So that didn't happen by accident. It, it doesn't, you, you don't start to develop these relationships with all the 19 building principals and members of the child study team and teaching staff and speech staff um, without having the guy at the helm kind of modeling that for you. Because right. if he were, de he were detached, I'd like to think I'd, I'd still do the right thing, but it certainly makes it a lot easier. Right. And your point at once, once you do start to make it feel smaller, you know who you can pick up the phone and call. Um, all of a sudden initiatives get easier to get off the ground because I know, I know you were administrator in the past and you have your key people that if you want to move in a different direction, you know, you need X, Y, and Z with you. Um, well, I, I have the number of my cell phone now, you know what I mean? So it's, it's helpful. I've been encouraged to do that since I've been in this role, even when he was the HR director, that's something that he kind of always encouraged us to do was, was really get to know, uh, get to know the staff to the greatest extent possible, given okay. the scale. Yeah. Cause, cause that, that, the, when someone says, oh, we're a large district, we can't do that. And, oh, we're a small district. We can't do that. I'm like, oh, that's just your mentality. It's not, it's not actually a thing. There's mm -hmm. no like law that says small districts can't do this and big districts can't do this. Right. It is, it is a mentality that you have to shift. And like, how do you, how do you, you know, think differently about, some of the work that you're doing and, and, and connecting. So that is a, a very uh, personable thing. And I, and, and like, as much as I want to give credit to Ed, I saw it in your, like your leadership team throughout. I saw it in your principals. I actually, uh, <laughs> this might be a little embarrassing. I saw one of your principals on that day, dressed up like wearing like a super Mario brothers. Outfit. Yeah. You know Mike Siler. Oh man. We had, we had What's another that? one dressed up with this. Mike Siler getting a shout out. His whole staff was dressed up like Mario. I mean, that's the kind of stuff. If you, a lot of the principals were decked out that day. Right. I'll be honest. We had the, so the part I did when we did like the t-shirt launch thing, right. I, I was having anxiety of the night before that we were going to say, all right, now look out for your principal. And then everything's going to be silent. We're having this music playing. People are throwing t-shirts at people just sitting in a chair you like this. Hit in the head. Not at all. As soon as I said the word principal, the whole staff lost it, which, yeah. you know, See how this stuff tried, lost it in a good way. They were very excited, right. um, and you can see how this stuff starts to sort of, sort of trick. It's, I shouldn't say trickle down. They've been here longer than we have. Right. Trickle to, to Ed right. and I because they've done that in their buildings. You know, I love that. Okay, so last question I got for you. So at the end of this year, if you, what would success look like? And I know that it's a, it's not like, hey, 
you're not going to arrive to something. And then you're at the end of this year. And like, as long as we're this, like we always continuously grow, but what, what do you see? Like, what would a successful year look like in Edison for you? Sure. So, um, there's a couple, there's a couple things that I, I can point to. Number one, um, I think you might be familiar with it in the, in the States, but there's a lot of federal money up for grabs for preschool expansion. Yeah. Um, we have a, a little bit of unique situation here that we're maxed out on room. So we can apply through the state of New Jersey for preschool expansion aid, uh, but how do you do that in a district where you're short on space? And the answer we've, and I shouldn't say come up with, it's an option, is to start to partner with uh, with the private preschools in the area, at least to get into the grant cycle and get off the ground. That's a big initiative for this year, um, getting there because the early childhood stuff, I mean, listen, the, the research is, is really clear. And right now we don't do a great job of it because we're not catching those 2000 or so kids that are out there that we could provide universal pre-K for. Mm -hmm. So for, for my department, that is, that's one instance of what success looks like. The other thing for us that I think is, is really important is just to get a sense of what our pro we talked about inclusion previously. Um, we have special class programs, uh, students that are neuroatypical or multiply disabled um, that have difficulty functioning in the gen ed environment. Those programs exist for them. But besides that, we are almost entirely an inclusive district. So if we have a child that's struggling reading, we look to do pullout services a small part of their day. But the vast majority of our, our, our students are in an in-class resource setting with two teachers. And I don't know what the metric is for this. But I want those kids to be successful. I think inclusion is such a powerful model. Again, the research is out there. Yeah. And it's a powerful model when um, when we do it effectively. It can also come off the rails really quick. So yeah. two of our secondary supervisors right now are working with the New Jersey uh, Consortium of Inclusive Ed um, to really train up our teachers. Um, it's one thing just to push students into a gen ed classroom and say, hey, yeah, look, the research says it's great. It's another to equip our teachers with the tools. That inclusive ed, um, the consortium stuff's happened at the secondary level. And then we're pursuing Orton certification, not Orton training, but Orton certification for all of our elementary teachers. That's going to take time. But so, yeah, we we get we we submit a successful application to preschool expansion aid, the instructional practices and inclusion in, or in ICR improve at the secondary level or, or get better. Um, that's not to say that they're bad. And we have a larger percentage of our special education teachers at the elementary level, Orton certified. That, that That's what success looks like for me at the end of this year. I love it. Okay. So I'll give you, I'm going to give you one metric though, that yeah. I want you to consider. Uh, since I was there, I, mm -hmm. when I was there, I actually, was just, just so excited at how people were, how excited people were. And when you introduced the principles mm -hmm. and when you all came up and when Ed came up, there was just, there was like huge applause. People were really excited. Your metric is, will it be louder next year or not so much? Yeah, that's a good that, one. That will tell you everything. That will tell yeah. you everything about, cause I've like, everyone's excited for the first year of a new superintendent. Yep. See what happens a second. All right. I'll, I'll keep you updated. I'll let you know. You can tell, add that one too, because I think that actually will, and that is not a, that's, and you, you, you touch on this. This is not a reflection on Ed. This is a reflection on all of you who yes. are leading, because I think sometimes, and this is, this is kind of why I make the central office jokes like, I, and I do, because I was in central office and mm -hmm. a lot of what I saw was, you know, we are going to dump things on teachers to justify our jobs as mm -hmm. opposed to we got to figure out how do we remove as many barriers, you know, for our staff so that they can do the most important things with their kids. And that yeah. tells you a lot about the culture. So that, that will be, I know those other things are very important, but I'll tell you that you'll see next year. You'll, it'll Challenge you accepted. Fun. I'll video it with the front camera. From the <laughs> front. Tag, tag me on Insta. I'd love to see that. So, Hey Tom, it was, it was, it was awesome chat with you. My best to uh, your wife and your mom, who I, I know are also in education. So I, I appreciate you giving us out. Make sure to say hi to everyone um, in Edison and, and, and to your leadership team. And, and I hope you have an amazing year. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on George. It was really All great right. seeing you again. All right. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a wonderful day.